leave with one or two things that they can apply to their organization. So if you leave with just one or two ideas, if you want to follow up with us, you're welcome to. Uh, maybe you want us to look at something or, or take, take advantage or follow up question. Um, I would like to talk to you first about your board of directors, which is your leadership team. Um, think of yourself, position yourself at the board table. Thank you, Michael. Think, position yourself at the board table uh, with your board of directors. And I'll give you the, the best practices, the smart practices of boards of directors. And then maybe you'll have some questions about, well, here's how we do it. Of course, your culture is different. Your legal requirements, registration with government is different. But I will give you the smart practices. Um, the best model, and I think there's a slide, Michael. Uh, the best model is that the board governs and the staff manages. Board governs and staff manages. That's it. If you can get that concept in place, um, that the board of directors, the volunteer leaders, are responsible for guiding the future of the organization. They serve the members. They protect the resources. They're the sounding board in the community, what's going on in the community. They bring expertise to the, to the organization. They're passionate. They're dedicated. But there's also problems that can occur with the board of directors. You can have a board of directors that micromanages everything and thinks that they're, they're better at managing the tasks than the staff or the committees are. I want the board to always be at a 50,000 foot level. So there's actually an al altimeter or altitudes for the board of directors. Um, the board is always at 50,000 feet looking into the future of the organization, the sustainability and the value of the organization. The committees work for the board of directors and they're at about 25 or 30,000 feet supplementing the work of the, the board of directors and the staff is tactical, they are, are, are taking care of the, the fine details of running the organization. So back to board governs, staff manages. That's the best thing I can ask my board of directors to do. You, you stick with governance according to ministry law and our bylaws and our policies and let the staff do the administration and, and management of the organization. Um, so the average size board in the USA is 15. Now, admittedly, there are many organizations that have more than 15 people on the board of directors. Um, the reason that 15 works is it allows for a meaningful conversation when you have a board meeting in person or remotely over the phone. A board of 20 or 30 will extend the time required for governance um, not everyone will feel engaged. The larger the board, the more disenga disengaged some, some members of the boards will be. So when I look for what's the size of my board, I aim for something below 20. Admittedly, I've, I've seen boards with 100 or more people, um, but it's very difficult. And what they do is they give their authority to an executive committee. So that's the second best practice for, for your leadership team and the board of directors of your chamber of the association is that there's an executive committee, so the full board, 15 or whatever number, the executive committee is the officers of the organization. And what I like to do is empower the executive committee to make decisions in between meetings of the board of directors. So if the board cannot meet, especially during a pandemic and economic recovery, and your board members are not available, they're, they're trying to survive, then I need to give authority to my executive committee. The executive committee is most often five people. It's the elected president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, and usually the past president. Sometimes the, the, the uh, secretary general, or the executive director may serve on the executive committee, uh, but usually the executive committee are the only ones with votes. So in this time of pandemic, I want to engage my executive committee, and if we're gonna have a meeting of the board, I don't have a quorum, 
I don't have enough people from the board, a majority of the board to make decisions. I wanted the board to give my executive committee authority to make decisions. So that's an important process to make sure that your bylaws or that, that your board of directors respects the authority that the executive committee should have. I also like to give authority to the executive director. The, the, the secretary general is a professional and I want to make sure that, that they are they have the, the, the latitude or the ability to make decisions in between meetings of the board. The best practice for board members, you know 15 on the board, is a three-year term. So what we see is that we want rotation of the board of directors. So we see a three-year term. If they want, we'll invite them back or they can run for a second three-year term. At the end of that, it's their, the end of their term and they're no longer on the board of directors. Now that may be different for you. There are many times that the founders or members are very proud of their position and they wanna continue on the board of directors. The reason for term limits is to allow new people to get on the board. We might want some young professionals, emerging leaders. We want, might want some diversity of ideas and people on the board of directors. If the board does not turn over, then there's no room for other members to step in and, and take a leadership role. So term limits have a, a great value. The typical term is either two years or three years, maybe a maximum of two terms or three terms. So it amounts to about six, six years on the board before they've given, contributed to the organization, it's time to move on. We do an annual orientation. And your board members may say, oh, we did that last year, I know everything, We're, I'm fine. So what I call it is refresh and blend. What we wanna do is refresh the board of directors about the organization. Our budget is different. We may have new committees. Um, so I wanna do a, an annual orientation. I want to record it to make sure that we know that we did the orientation. The orientation should take about two hours. It may be the secretary general who offers it. It could be your legal counsel. <coughs> um, it could be another executive director, someone like Wumi or Grace could do the orientation. But I want the board to understand their role in governance what the governing documents are, and the distinction between governing and management. Staff is management, board is governance. Um, and then the committees work for the board of directors. So every committee should pr be producing results. If you appoint committees, or you have committees, and they don't produce results, there's not a good reason for having them. If you have a committee, you have to manage the committee, you have to help the committee, you have to staff the committee. I like to think that if an organization has four or five goals in their strategic plan, maybe they only have one or two committees to advance each of the goals. So I've seen a lot of organizations, a lot of boards that might have had 15 or 20 committees, reduce the number of committees to just those that are essential to the board of directors. A committee that's not performing or underperforming, it's time to let it go. We'll grieve over letting it go, but get the, the, the organization to be uh, as efficient as possible. I don't want a committee to waste your time or cause liability for the organization. The graphic on the left side is something that you could create for your own organization. So what it is, it's actually a, a, on cardstock or laminated, and I use it every year to do board orientation. So I'm giving the board a very simple tool as to here's your responsibilities, here's staff responsibilities, here's the list of committees, here's our registration with the ministry, here's the governing documents you need to read, here's the policies that we have about conflicts of interest and disclosing conflicts of interest, which is another best practice that, that, uh, that, that the board, if there's any conflict, they should disclose it they should not be on the board for personal gain. And it's worth repeating, no one on the board should be there for personal gain. They are there to advance the mission of the organization and to serve as a volunteer leader 
to advance the mission, protect the resources, set policy, work with advocacy, um, and protect the resources. Now, Lars, outside of governance, the board may be asked to do volunteer work too. So we will ask our board members to take off their governance hat and maybe reach out for sponsorship dollars, maybe testify before government authority. So the board role and governance is a little bit different than when they take off their governance hat and they're a volunteer in the organization helping the staff. And all of that's dis disclosed or discussed at a board orientation. Um, the board orientation document you have, see in front of you, if you'd like to have a copy of it, please write to, to SIP Africa, and Lars will get that for you. Um, Michael, the, the next slide for me. The, the repetitive statement is the board governs and the staff manages. That's the model that works. This is the opportunity to engage your board at a time when there's a crisis. Now, I'm seeing board members disappear because of the crisis. All of a sudden, they're fighting for survival. I need my board members to continue their role in governance, to lead the organization. The members want to see the leadership team leading. Um, so I, this is an opportunity to really galvanize or engage the board of directors. Um, I would, I would use the expertise that each board member brings. And the opposite of a board that's not performing during this crisis would be one that is absent or they want to micromanage. Their role is still not micromanaging during a crisis. Their role is to lead the organization, let the staff manage, the committees manage, but the board needs to stay pretty high up there 50,000 foot leading the organization. I would give them permission for the next six months to think short term, but when it comes to December and January of next year, they need to go back to long term thinking. So this is an opportunity for the board to shine, to be a leadership team, to speak for the organization, to advocate, um, and really keep the organization strong if they will come together as a leadership team. Lars, I think that's it for boards and governance. I'm happy to ask, answer questions later on or privately by email. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, I have a bunch of questions, but we'll hold off and <laughs> we have uh, we've had given an opportunity to Grace uh, go ahead and uh, and uh, introduce make an introduction. Um, just uh, for all of the panelists, again, feel free to use the, the chat uh, function in terms of uh, uh, putting in your questions. So if you have questions about what Bob just uh, presented, please use that chat function. And then afterwards, I will come to you to, um, to actually uh, read out your, your question to Bob. Uh, with that, uh, Grace, uh, can you go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, we'll, we'll turn this over to Grace. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly, Grace. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> Grace, are you there? All right. Um, good afternoon. Of, of good day. My name is Grace. Grace, we can't hear you. Can you say something? All right, <clears throat> so I, will, I guess I will go ahead and ask uh, Bob a few questions while we try to get Grace back. Grace, Grace is back. Her, her little boy solved the tech problem. Fabulous. Grace, you're muted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. 
Are you now trying to hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Oh, good. Yes. Sorry. I, I was saying thank you very much for, um, you know, for this time and for this moment. I want to, I, I was saying that Bob has been doing a wonderful um, activity of making sure that we learn about uh, our associations, how we can run them, especially during this uh, crisis times. And I just want to take us through quickly how we can be able to identify opportunities in communication and how we can utilize these uh, opportunities, first of all, to make sure that we have our members regardless of this situation, but even most importantly, how we can ensure that um, we serve our members productively. Now, the goal of communication usually uh, is to make sure that you do not get forgotten. And that is why we, as association members, as chamber, as chamber leaders, we must make sure that we are constantly communicating with our members. Because if they forget us during this time, and a lot is going on in the world right now, it's easy to be forgotten. If they forget us, then how are we going to be, you know, how do we pick up that relationship that we've been creating for years with them after this um, crisis is over? So how do we... Grace, we seem to have lost audio on you. Grace, are you there? Hello, Grace. <clears throat> Grace, we don't uh, hear you. Michael, I, can you unmute Grace? I'm trying to, but it won't allow me. Let's switch over. I think Wumi may have been able to join us, and now she seems to have left. Um, Lars, if you want to go to any questions on governance, I, I'm glad to do that. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> in terms of, of your list, you, one of the things you said was, you know, the committees work uh, specifically for the board. So if the go board governs and the secretariat manages, how do you set up board members as volunteers to actually do specific functions which might be fundraising or uh, if there's an, a major event. Um, can you explain to us in terms of sort of the organizational structure, how, yeah. what is the difference between really what the function of a committee, the purpose of a committee? And then one other question, Don't, aren't committees mandated by the bylaws? So if you had to pick committees, what are the most important committees to have, especially now during this time of crisis? Super, good. Um, so on the, um, on the committee question, um, I would expect that every organization, chamber or business association uses committees. Their bylaws very often will identify what, what is called standing committees. Committees that are required by the bylaws are usually one year in length. They're a standing committee. And I would expect them to be maybe addressing nominations and elections, financial audits and oversight, um, um, bylaws reviews. So the trend is when there's a need for a committee to appoint an ad hoc committee or a task force. So the shorter, the, uh, the task force is a short-term assignment that the board may say, during the pandemic, we need to, to identify 
um, resources for protective equipment. We need to distribute it in the market. And we're gonna ask our task force to help us with that, identify the manufacturer, pick up the mass, distribute it to the market. So that's a task force. That would probably be my, uh, my, my uh, um, pandemic equipment task force. So standing committees appointed in the, uh, identified in the bylaws, task forces or strike forces or quick action teams are appointed by the board of directors for specific pro specific assignment, and then they disband when they're done. Now, Lars, I may have board members who both serve as committee members and board members. So, so as I say, when the board is, is convened, the board is governing, but there are times when a member of the board is asked if you help us raise funds. We need sponsors for an event coming up. Um, we need you to help us um, um, with sign up new members or visit member offices. Um, so board members may serve in both roles, governance when they're on the board table and um, volunteer committee roles. Now, I'm gonna, I'll give this to, back to Grace in a second. The, the two reasons I'm probably gonna appoint a committee, Lars, and to everyone on the phone, is um, because our budget is identified, we need to raise money. We're going to have $10,000 in sponsorship. We're going to have uh, 15 people come to a seminar. So because of the budget, I may appoint committees to do the work and fundraising and advance parts of the, of the budget. I also may appoint committees because of the strategic plan. If you've identified seven priorities in your strategic plan, then I would appoint committees to make sure that those seven priorities are advanced. So committee authority to appoint them from the governing documents, uh, maybe long-term or short-term, and aligned with the budget and with the strategic plan, they supplement the work of the board and they supplement the work of the staff. Committees can be very, very valuable to an organization if they're effective, if they have an orientation, if they understand what their roles are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Yes, sir. Bob. Heck no. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Any question? Uh, I, the only area I have question is on uh, this association management and the committees. I noticed that uh, sometimes when you want to handle some issues and the executive, at the executive level, if uh, sometimes you have problem of not getting everybody at the same time, yeah, and these are an issue that because it, some of this thing has to do with the volunteerism. When we are volunteering, we find that we find out that not everybody will work at the same pace. Sure. Uh, uh, because sometimes, as individuals, as uh, private business owners, we have a uh, various and uh, private timetable for our uh, our actions and our activities. And by the time we want to do certain things collectively, you find out that it is not always easy to get everybody at the same time. So my question now is, how possible do we reduce the, you know, because what I mean, what I know is that the larger the number, the more difficult for us to meet. Yes. So how do you reduce this committee to the barest minimum? And making sure that, no matter the size of or the population, the number of people that gather, they can take decision, provided that this decision will really uh, enhance the the performance of that association. So, because I, I look at 15 as being too much, because in our own area here, we find out that uh, associations are made of individual uh, business practitioners that may not actually, because they are, they are small scale practitioners. Small in the sense that if they don't work, they will not eat. And these are the people that form the bulk of the association members. 
So this is uh, this is what I want to know. I understand. I think could I just could I, I just quickly ask partly you answer the question. Um, I like your concept that that fifteen is large for committee. I would go with three to five people for the board. I'd go to fifteen. And we might agree that 15 is a crowd sometimes. I'd rather govern with seven to nine people. But I also work with organizations that have 100 on the board. So you've identified the, the, the answer, too, is that for an effective committee, if, they, if they're having a tough time getting together, I want to make it a small body. I want to give them a short-term assignment. I may give them a, a quick action team. We just need you to work for one day or two days. I may give one or two people a micro task, a volunteer task for just one thing that we need them to do. So I agree with you that people are surviving, fighting for survival, and it's hard to get them to serve. So I need to break the committee tasks down to micro tasks. So I agree with you. Thank you. Okay, that's, thank you. Uh -huh. Nice. Could I could I ask that everyone identify themselves as well when they ask a question? Thank you, Ryan. Grace, I think the floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much. Apologies for earlier. Uh, you know, internet decided that it's uh, time for 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 it to go at that moment when I was just about to. To present and but I'm very glad that uh, I could join all of you and I have been following Bob's presentations in the last uh, couple of webinars and I'm so glad because I have also learned so much uh, that has informed uh, my work now I want us to talk about something that um, we are probably all asking ourselves and you know the issue of communication how do we communicate during this time when there seems to be a crisis and the communication opportunities are not your normal audience. Communication is not the way it happens. It's not the normal thing as we do it because a lot of things have changed. For instance, now we no longer, you know, there, 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 there is no congregations that we can bring together. We can't have events. We cannot call for press conferences as we used to. We can't do roadshows and other events and, and social events that we used to do to actually provide opportunities for visibility and communication to our members. And so I want us to quickly just go through that and see how it is that we can identify communication opportunities during this moment of our crisis. The first thing that you may want to do is actually look at your, you know, assess your environment. How do you do that? Using the usual technique, pestel, that we, we know about. We've used this, all of us have done this before. You look at your political environment. How has it changed because of this uh, crisis that we are going on, uh, where we're going through as a world? Look at the environmental um, uh, situation. How is it? Look at your social interactions. How has it, have they been uh, affected technologically? What is at stake right now? How are people using technology or not using it? You need to look at your economic situation. How has it been affected? And how, how much can you contribute into it? And finally, what are the legal things? Uh, what Legally, what has changed? And what can land you into trouble? And what cannot land you into trouble? I'll give you an, a, a very good example. Um, of, for example, what is happening in Kenya right now because of the COVID situation, of course, one, the first things, the first, very first things to be closed, like every, everywhere else were the restaurants and the hotels. The, the, that industry, the hospitality industry has really been affected and nothing is happening. So if you have members in that kind of a, of a in that kind of a sector, how do you communicate to them knowing that very well right now they are stranded? They, probably the last thing they want to hear from you is, you know, is to hear anything like, like you asking for membership dues and stuff like that. So what, how do you use this opportunity to talk to them? First of all, identify what has happened politically, what has happened because they're in that sector. Environmentally, what's happening to them? Socially, what are the things that have been put there? Like in the hotel industry, I was talking about that earlier is that Right now in Kenya, when the hotel industry was closed, the first thing that 
you know, after, after the first six weeks, the government now opened the space and said, now hotels can open and restaurants can open. However, they have to put in place social distancing. So, and also they said, when you go in there, you know, you have to sit in 10, in spaces of 10 meters, or 10 centimeters or 10 meters, whatever, a meter away from each other. So if you have members in that sector, how do you help them to fit into those regulations? And how else can these people take up business or take their business so that they are able to actually survive during this particular um, crisis? So you understand the environment and then look at their concerns. Merge the environment and their concerns and come up with a workable situation. I'll give you an example of what has happened um, in some of the associations that we're working with the chambers, especially what they have done is to, first of all, they've come up with, um, with licenses for people that deliver food and other essential commodities across the country. So they can be able to travel because we had a lockdown. For the hotel industry, what they've done is to come up with local or domesticated um, regulations and procedures of getting back to business. So, Grace, we've lost your audio. We still can't hear you. Can anybody hear her or am I? Okay. Grace, you're still not there. No audio, Grace. Uh, Grace, no audio. Goodness. Okay, I will use this moment. We do have Wumi here with us and I am going to potentially open this up to her. Let's give this a shot. Hi, Wumi, are you with us? All right, don't have her. Grace? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, you're back. Yeah. Well, thank you. Oh my goodness, I cannot believe this is happening today. So you look at your concerns, your member, your environment, look at their concerns, and look at your capacity as an association. What are the things that you can actually talk about during this particular moment? And next slide, Michael, please. So even um, as you look at your capacity, you need to make sure that you're looking at matching what you, your members want versus what you can do. So you take an issue that you can actually handle and an issue that is manageable. I find that, um, of course, you have to take, first of all, a long-term approach and a short-term approach. The short-term approach could be something that allows you to, you know, you know you will get a quick win. For instance, one of the quick wins I am seeing um, and lo locally in the associations is the issue of extension of licenses. So businesses are ideally supposed to pay licenses, permits, business permits to county governments and the national government at the beginning of the year. This COVID has come in at this point. So how can we communicate or help our members to survive or continue running? Grace, we've lost you again. To the businesses and ensure that I mean the county government find that as an opportunity with the county government to actually talk about um, look at so that once you identify what the issue is, you need to quickly go ahead and now use the opportunities that we usually use. This opportunity could be, for example, the media. When you talk about the media, we are talking about press releases, we are talking about being on radio shows, television interviews, news stories, anything that makes you be at the forefront, at the face 
of your members. What are you doing there when you're in the media? You're telling them, this is how we are sorting you out. Yes, right now as a chamber, we cannot do much for you because you know we, we may not be offering our, sub, our services at optimum, but we are negotiating with the county government, for example, to help you, to help them extend the licensing, for instance. Another opportunity that you have, not to be forgotten, to keep communicating, is what I call branding and co-branding. This is where you actually, uh, you know, identify things, uh, what to call IC, information, communication materials that you can use to keep yourself at the forefront of people's minds. This could be simple things that are not necessarily generated by you, but you could co-brand. So it could be like maybe one of your members, one of the members could be a big organization, or you could get a sponsor who could agree to put your logo in somebody else. A good example, again, is what I have seen, for example, the Embu Chamber do, is get, they are, you know, come up with soap, hand washing soap, and just brand it. People will never forget. Every time they are washing their hands in the market, they, they see that logo, they will never forget the chamber. You may want to go into research or partner with other with organizations that undertake research. And this is very key because it helps you very much um, in, in terms of uh, being able to provide factual information and do um, what do you call it? and do um, factual advocacy. Okay, evidence-based advocacy. Mm -hmm. So you want to engage with people like universities, think, think tanks, of course, credible think tanks, not just anyone. So you want to engage with think tanks, you want to engage with um, universities and come up with a research about things that are happening, how business is being affected and make sure that this research is structured in such a way that you can release this information constantly. That keeps you in people's minds. They will never forget about you. And this is how now you get the media to come to you. Because every time they want to find out what's the situation for the business, they'll come looking for you. Because they know you have credible information. On the other hand, that your members will be happy that you're providing um, evidence-based research. So whatever it is you're talking about is something that will make sure that uh, their issues are taken care of. You may want to do polls, and polls are easy to do. You can do them on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter. You know, there are all sorts of polls. You could decide every week you're going to do a poll on something amongst your members. And you can use simple tools that don't require you to use a lot of money, like Facebook, for example, or, or Twitter, or even WhatsApp. It depends on where your audience is. When um, you could even send, you know, a text message. It depends on your on your on your audience. Social media. I've already alluded, alluded to that. Partnerships and MOUs are an other opportunities for communication that are very good. You do not be doing everything all by yourself. You can partner with people, um, especially organizations that are at the forefront of. Uh, helping businesses you can even come up with a memorandum of understanding and again important uh, this morning we we're just having a call with one of the chambers that we work with the was English chamber and one of the things they say is that this um covid situation has helped them to accelerate their good relations with the county government initially they would have these challenges but because of this situation the county government has called them and said, now come. And this has given them an opportunity to even be able to advocate better and now communicate with their members because they get, they're able to take their, their members' concerns directly to the, to the county government. And that's something that's very, very important. Webinars, anybody who can be on WhatsApp can be on a webinar. Hello? It's as simple as that. There is no complication. So if anyone is at a position to be on WhatsApp, they're able, of course, to be, be forgotten. Finally, is advocacy. Of course, um, we have alluded to advocacy all through, but just constantly making sure that you're speaking for your members so that they, they know that you care for them and you're sorting out their problem. My friends, the goal in communication during this time 
is to make sure that you cannot be forgotten. If you can keep you, your, if you can keep yourself in your members' mind at this moment and keep yourself there positively by sorting out their problems, then it will be very difficult for you to be forgotten. Thank you very much, lad. Thank you, Grace. Um, you, you, you've given us a nice laundry list, Grace, of all that you can be doing, what you probably should be doing normally, not just related to the pandemic. Um, so if I, can I briefly just ask you to give what it would be your one recommendation, your top recommendation that you would, uh, that you would uh, tell associations or chambers right now so they will never be forgotten? All right, my top, top recommendation is make sure that you engage with, engage in advocacy. That's the top, that's the biggest, because that's the greatest opportunity that is available right now. Advocacy will definitely lead you to everywhere else. Okay, thank you. Uh, hopefully we have Wumi. Wumi, can you uh, say something? Are you with us? Hello, Wumi. Hello. Hi, Wumi. Hi, Wumi. We can. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. Wumi, you're having, you're having challenges with communication. It's just uh, perfect timing. Oh. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I have technical difficulties, but finally I'm here. My apologies. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Please proceed, Wumi. Yes. Thank you. Um, again, my apologies, but they, I'm here to tell, I know that association, no, I bet COVID-19 was not on your 2020 program of work. Yeah. Now you are found, I mean, you are supposed to be making a rapid response to confront a crisis of this monumental scale. I thought we should start from the very beginning. Who are we? What is, um, what are associations? Why do people, I mean, members come to join you? We know that it's a voluntary partnership of business and professional people, but they have come to your association not for God's sake, not because they want to be good. They have expectations. They want to make good business. They want decent return from their investment. So they want to join the membership of you know, an association of like minds of business people that can you know, uh, that will add value to, their, to the business they do. They are business people and they expect return. So, but they come with tons of expectations when they join, when they approach, I mean, when they want to call, uh, join your mem uh, membership. It is important that associations must be very clear with the products they offer to potential members. Otherwise, you see them come in in droves. You are happy that you have, you know, uh, you are having uh, membership uh, uh, development, but watch out. The back door is wide open. If they do not uh, get the expectations fulfilled, if you do not give appropriate response to them, they will exit through the back door. So it is important that you are clear on how you conduct business and de uh, deliver services. Services generally that association uh, 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 give or offer, we call them association products. They give membership services. They give, depending on the nature or the sector the business belongs to, you give information. Information that, you know, they, they, they require. They turn to you for information. They want clarity on certain policies probably that have been, that are going to impact on their operation. 
that they do not understand exactly. They want you to chew on those policies and uh, explain that to them, show them how that is going to impact them or interpret that to them. So they turn to you for information as association. You do research and training. You do public relations. But above all, you do government relations, advocacy. They have so many issues that impact them. The, uh, the, the terrain, you know, they, they are face to face every day with issues, market issues, policy issues. It is respite if they come, you know, the, the, the natural place to go is the association to, um, for, you know, interpretation of uh, certain policies or, you know, just for respite. So, we know that government relations and policy advocacy is a big product of association. It is the government, you know, government is on that side of the divide. Your members are on this side. Government does not necessarily, most times does not have the heart of business on its head. They do think that sometimes you see policy disconnect, policies, regulations that will host business. Democracy allows you state, as a business association, to have your members come together. They are directly impacted by these issues. They can talk to the issues. If an operator in the marketplace that has never been to school, you don't need a university degree in economics, but because he or she is face-to-face, -face, the company is face-to-face -face on daily basis, with realities in the market, they can tell you in glad some detail how it feels. They, tell, they know the issues, they know what solutions, what exactly will impact positively on their situation. So this, you know, the, coming together, your, your, the association offers that a service for your members to come together to look at issues through the spectacles of business, they, as you know, stakeholders, as uh, those who are impacted by the issues, and then you are giving them opportunity to use their voice, through their voice, and democracy creates space for them to be heard. It is a right for governments to open up, I mean, to open up and to receive uh, feedback from stakeholders that are impacted by policy. So that is a big issue that, I mean, a big uh, uh, product of association, and we should do that more. Um, as one association management uh, manager, I bet you did not expect that this is going to be what you are face to face with in 2020. It wasn't on your plan, it wasn't on your calendar, but here you are face to face with a pandemic of a monumental uh, scale, such as um, the one we are confronted with. Did the situation overwhelm you? Yes. Now the big question is how is your association responding to this? Um, the go to resource, the go to place for your members is, the, is your association. So it is expected that you will give appropriate response. What we have seen among the associations during this pandemic is some are just at a loss. They are like, this is not part of the deal this year. We really don't know how to proceed. But that's the, that, that's the old uh, idea. Your members will turn to you. And association managers in particular and that's why I like to, uh, you know, uh, you, you are supposed to perform magic <laughs> with the support of your, 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 uh, your board. How will a, a lean staff, for instance, function? Uh, Bob already shared with you how uh, committee system works. Action groups, committees, tax forces. Your raw material, your resource are your members. Voluntary membership, that is what that means. You, when, you know, this, you capture on the, as you enroll members, 
you want to make sure that all important information that you will be needing about that member is captured. What is his interest? What sector are they? You know, what will they be looking for? What, what is, you know, you expect that from all the data that you have on that member, you know their core competence, you know their interest. Those are members that will serve on a particular committee. Those ones that are uh, sectorally, I mean, from the same sector, they are singing from the same humble. This, you know, you know the resource that every member brings to the table or to the association. So when you bring them together like that, they are going to be your the staff support because this association does not have the funds to uh, to to hire every single uh, human resource that it needs on its. Uh, you know, to deliver its job. Your raw material, your, your assets are your members. And that's why they sit at the top, the, you, you exist to serve them, but at the same time, they are resource for you to, 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 uh, to run the association. If you look at the organogram, I'm sure that uh, Bob already discussed, you know, that in his previous presentation. The member sits at the top, the apex of the organogram of an association. And that's not by accident. That is where they belong. They, they, the association exists for them. Association management serves them. The board sits at the boardroom considering, you know, how to provide, how to improve service for them. It is about the members. So in turn, your committees are served as serviced by members. They donate not only their dues, they bring their money, they bring their resources, they bring experience from you know, their businesses on sub-sectoral basis and all of that. The expertise that they have, they bring to your association. Thank um, you. I think, I think that's a good, good part uh, point for us to sort of move to the uh, uh, questions. Um, and so what I would like uh, to do is uh, for those of you that have your video on, if you have a specific question, uh, please wave or use the chat function if you do have that. I know some of you are on mobile phones. Um, and you can ask any question that you, you want to our panelists and experts. Uh, I will start this off for a question to Wumi. Wumi, now that we're talking about um, membership, and you've been talking about the importance of membership. The question I have for you is, how do you recruit members now when many of us are uh, working uh, remotely or you have the ability to actually go in and meet face-to-face? -face? So can you share with us uh, how do you recruit members now? How to recruit members now is uh, showcase how relevant you have been to existing members. There are people out there, there are businesses that are hurting simply because they don't know where to go. I know that there are associations that are giving appropriate response at this time to their members. They have negotiated soft landing. They have gone when the lockdown was really serious at the beginning. Associations have talked to authorities and they have secured, for instance, uh, movement uh, permit for those in critical sectors. They have uh, negotiated palliatives on behalf of their members. And there are those other in others in the industry that see all of it. They are within the community. They are wondering, how are you, why are you different? That is service. And, you know, so I know that beyond this, for smart associations, you are going to grow your membership because you have uh, stayed relevant, you have been there to support your members, and this is a challenge to those associations who are just at a loss as to what to do. It is at this time that we are relevant, it is at this time that uh, your association can know why the membership of your, I mean your members should know now why the membership of your association is such exceptional value. It's going to grow your membership. I will be surprised if you see people exit through the back door. It means that 
the association has not met their uh, expectations. The association was not there to place its hand on their shoulder. Um, associations definitely, you know, when people come to join you, you call it not for profit, but I bet it is also not for loss. You know, so you have to, you know, they think as business people, if you continue to give them service and let them know why the membership of your association is such exceptional value, you will grow your membership. Others will come. And so it made a difference during COVID-19 I, uh, I mean that you belong to the Chamber of Commerce. While we couldn't, we shut doors, we are right inside, we see you go back and forth. We are in the same industry. What is the difference? So my sh short uh, response to that is service, service delivery. And we need to be innovative. Many times we, are, you know, we have models to scale. Given the system, I mean the, uh, the the system within which we function, we've got to begin to think, to innovate, and think outside the box. Especially as association managers, I have had calls, for instance, in my uh, chamber career, to I mean I wasn't getting board uh, uh, board uh, uh, attendance. I mean uh, we were not forming quorum. It occurred to me I could try take them out to you know one of our members that was a national park. And no one could take his car, so they, 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 they don't uh, uh, escape. They don't leave the meeting or they go away. So the idea was they were going to the captive audience for three days. They were excited that it was, a, I mean, they were going on a, to a national park. It was a vacation. It was cool. The national park is a member of the Chamber of Commerce. We gave, they, we got discounted rates and so on. It was attractive. I had a full, for the first time in the history of the association, we had a full attendance of, uh, I mean, of the board. So you need to continue to think outside the box, continue to innovate, continue to look at other associations. What are they doing? Feel the pulse of your members from time to time. What are their needs? What can you do? And so on and so forth. Thank you, Wumi. Uh, now I would like to offer everyone an opportunity to ask a question. If you have a question, you have your video on wave and I will call upon you. Um, as you ask your question, please introduce yourself, your name, and uh, the association or chamber you represent. So we have one question from uh, Michael. You're gonna, actually gonna have to unmute because I don't have that function. I think you're on. Yeah. Ask your question, sir. Okay. All right, then. Uh, my name is uh, Prince Peter Bakari. I work for Federation of Agricultural Commodity Associations of Nigeria. Ah, nice. Uh, I've just joined in because I find it very, it took me about one hour <laughs> in order to be able to log in uh, for the conference. Uh, but I just want to uh, put it right there to what uh, Mrs. Karamasi have uh, spoken. Uh, during this uh, COVID period, our members that are into production of agricultural commodities uh, had to seek, you know, obligation from the government so that they can move around. And uh, because we know that uh, this time around, uh, if we are not too careful in the country, we may end up having shortage of food. Uh, for the populace. So the Anchor Brass, we took advantage of the Anchor Brass program of the Central Bank of Nigeria. And uh, during this period, we were able to mobilize, the commodity associations were able to mobilize thousands of their members in order to participate this year in the Anchor Brass program so that uh, we could be self-sufficient in food production uh, in spite of uh, uh, the COVID uh, 19. Uh, that's just a rider to what you've been able to do, but uh, we did it through our phone calls uh, because we couldn't get uh, to hold physical meetings. And um, about 15 commodity associations are participating in the Anchor Brass program now of the Central Bank of Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Peter. Um, Bob, Grace, or Wumi, do you have any comments or thoughts? 
Um, Peter, I, I also thank you for sharing, Peter. I think that that what you described in advocacy, even in a tough time, you found uh, partners through the bank. You were able to advocate through through uh, remote processes. You couldn't go into the ministry to to advocate. Um, so you positioned yourself as indispensable, and you continued your advocacy. 100% good work, good work. Wumi, do you have anything to add? Yes, yes, my challenge to the association is this. You are right, you know, we are talking about innovation and you, know, you do not have enough resources to do all that you want to do. Now in this tough situation, you have uh, negotiated soft landing for certain members who can still conduct business. You have some of your members that are making money. Even there are members of, I mean, in the business sector, that this is their boom time, especially those in your sector. The question is, what is return on investment for the association? Those are, you know, people that you need to, members that you need to cultivate, to make, to, uh, to sponsor events, to look at other members within the association and see how they can, you know, uh, support them because the reason they are operating is by the mercy of the association. It was service that Am I the time? They, uh, provided them. Thank you, Jimmy. Go. Thank you, Jimmy. To, uh, Wumi. Um, Mike. Here, or Bob, do you have something? No, I do see a couple of hands up though. Okay, who's next? Uh, please wave if you have a question. Mike. Right, Mike. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Mr. Lass, and the other participants, other people participating in this um, August meeting. Um, I need to be candid. Uh, for My name is Mike, uh, the General Secretary for NASMI Lagos and Joint Association of Small and Medium Scale Enterprises. Uh, I just want to see if we can have more insight to the value proposition BMOs and chambers of commerce are offering this unique period because the truth of the matter is it is going to be very difficult for us to be self-sustaining in terms of asking of subscription this period for our members. I can I can tell you a lot of them. Um, we were trying to try advocacy program. We're trying to see if our members can benefit from this uh, COVID-19 form from, from federal government. And um, the, the truth of the matter is we, we, we enjoy a lot of expenses is going to send a representative to Abuja trying to advocate for, you know, see how our members can benefit in this period. We're not even asking for, for substitution, as a matter of fact. He made mention of the Anchor Borrowers Program. We've been on this for, for quite a while. Like I'm telling you, again, I'm talking to you now, we've not been able to plant. Yeah, we've, we've not been able, especially, it's affecting Southwest. And I'm, 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 I'm afraid of a hunger strike and security issues in the Southwest of Nigeria because this money has not been released. You know, we need to see how we can come together and form a coalition and, and, and deepen our existing or OPS, uh, OPS um, or coalition and see how government can listen, can listen. This is not a time to play politics around anything. This is time to put real intervention to the risk sector. The truth of the matter is going to have a lot of unemployment, going to have a lot of security. What is the solution? And those are the solutions we'll be tabling up to people that really want to listen. Thank you very much. That's just my own little take on this subject matter. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. And so Perfect. Mike is really addressing a critical thing here, which is not only your members are hurting, this is in time of... Uh, how does the association really thrive? And I think those come to the fundamental questions. Um, I let's hear from uh, any thoughts from Grace. Okay, I, I think um, what the issue that Mike is raising is of course very valid, and it's also something that's not just in Nigeria; it's happening everywhere, even in Kenya. I mean, those are the challenges. But what I, some of the opportunities that exist, and I have seen the chambers, especially at the county level, take up is the issue of trying to link up their small businesses to thriving sectors. For instance, right now, everybody is making masks. That's an opportunity for your, 
your members, the small businesses that are actually in that textile sector to get in there. I think the opportunity there exists in linkages. Are you in a position to link your businesses so that they get individualized benefits? Are you in a position to do that? And while you're doing that, again, you ask, ask yourself what uh, Wumi was saying. What's the, uh, the return on investment for the chamber or for your association? How can you do that? Because these opportunities exist, you just need to look out for them. And uh, like I said, when you analyze your political environment, you do your pastel, you'll be able to see these little opportunities just like the previous speaker had had uh, said they identified an, an opportunity, you'll be able to do that. But in terms of um, advocating, you cannot keep quiet. You have to continue advocating, but also you need to advocate looking at the most, um, um, looking at it from a short-term and a long-term perspective. I'll go to Bob next. Hey, Mike, um, thanks for the, the statement, and I'm glad you're wearing your safety belt. I, I, I agree with Wumi and Grace. Um, the value, and I, I have great respect for the, the small, medium entrepreneurs, um, advocacy, and you know what they need, you are the person to do it, your passion comes through the screen. Um, information resource, you are where they turn for the latest information, not just on the virus, but on extensions, on deadlines, on requirements. Um, you continue with market expansion, market share. Um, you continue with uh, um, business capacity. Um, you are the platform for coalitions and communications. Mike, I think you've got a, a, a dynamic organization. Thank you for sharing. Will me a quick thought? Yes. Um, the question he, he asked, he raised the question about what to have, what will happen with deals. Um, uh, what would be the status of Jews, especially because they have not done business, they are, you know, really, even taxes are being negotiated with government. So it will not be surprised if your members come back to you and they cannot pay their dues. But then there are those that have been, I mean, they are doing great business among your members that you have, uh, for whom you have uh, negotiated soft landing, so the ones that you got uh, passes for, the ones that you ask government to, I mean, to, uh, to procure face ma uh, masks and so on from, from them, it will be paid far back time for such association. And I think you should challenge your members. You have a record of them. You have a record of what you have done. And it is paid back time for the association. That's how it works. You have for uh, you know, all that you, you have, it's your, your main income is from, from dues. So if this is now happening, and you cannot blame those members, if they are not in position, they are not in production, they are not in business, you can't get your dues. So those, just make sure you have a good record of those that you have, um, uh, you have supported during this period. So they will now be the cash cows for that period. Uh, if they are going to keep the doors of their association open. And then you, you will have proved your relevance. I think they will stay back and do what they have to do. Thank you, Wumi. Uh, I think in terms of timing here, we're going to uh, go next to uh, Babatola. We have two questions lined up. And so let's uh, start with Babatola. Babatola, if you can introduce yourself and your There's no audio. Uh, we do have a uh, question from Micah Lade from Nasme. Can we advocate for one year tax break for all MSMEs in our post COVID plans across developing countries? And uh, you can, I mean, <laughs> you can, good luck on that. I mean, that's going to be. That's going to be very, very difficult. You need to. Uh, can I say something last, Matt? What? Uh, can I just say, I have put my thoughts on that. 
already I, i'll tell you it it's possible it's actually it might actually be possible for it to happen um because already like in kenya reviewing our finance act for 2019 2020 that we are implementing in the current budget we've already got a reduction well, of tax it, it and a review of differ tax of credits that is of be um th thank you okay, thank you very much um it is possible but it's not difficult we understand mm -hmm. that the government need a lot of revenue to fund the budget um for nigeria case that is peculiar a crude oil benchmark was 50 dollars per barrel and now crude oil is even selling that the less than 20 dollars so the government was forced to review it to 20 dollars per barrel i will still find it difficult to sell the whole what i'm saying is if we don't get complete tax waiver for that one year can we get tax you know incentives or tax advance payments. Now, the SMEs, for them to be able to stabilize their cash flow, I'm supposed to be paying one million as tax for this year. Can I pay 200,000? Then I cannot pay it on a spread of five years. You know, we need to make everything possible for these SMEs to survive. The truth of the matter is multinationals, multinationals, they're going to downsize. That's a, it is the MSME subsector that will accommodate this set of people into the labor market. The truth of the matter. But we need to create every enabling environment for this MSME to survive. So it is possible. It, our point of negotiation will be tax-free. But we can, leave, we can leave some leverage, some level of compromise into a discount, into advanced credit payment. That will be our form of a meeting point. That's my own point, strategic point towards it, Mr. Lass. Thank you, Mike. And so I'm going to, I mean, in terms of, of responding to your question, I think you, you've already offered three or four different types of solutions. Now, what is your evidence that this is going to uh, capitalize and uh, create uh, an opportunity for SMEs not only to survive, but thrive and create employment? So in terms of the first thing you need to do is if you have these four potential solutions is understand both the economic impact that this might have, both the positive and the negatives, and then understand, as Grace was talking about, how best to communicate it. One of the other things that you're going to need to do is you're going to have other interests that are going to pose what you are, what I've heard you propose there. And so you have uh, some, some of them might be with the government themselves, some of them might be within the business communities themselves. So the second thing you need to do is, is coordinate among others in terms of the messaging, in terms of specifically what you're asking for. You were very clear and concise in terms of what your asks were. Now just to provide some evidence that you, what you were proposing makes a lot of sense. Uh, we have another question, uh, essentially how are associations helping SMEs and businesses that are import dependent on for local sourcing? So what this is going to a question of local content. How are associations, uh, considering the disruptions in supply chain, helping their local businesses in terms of uh, being able to provide uh, 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 materials, goods, uh, locally. Wumi or Grace, do you have any examples of how associations are specifically helping uh, in terms of the supply sourcing? Yes, maybe I, I could uh, quickly put my thoughts onto that. One of the things, again, that um, the associations we are working with and also the bigger ones in this country, what they have done is to negotiate for people in certain value chains to continue, um, you know, doing their business amid, of course, with a lot of checks and, and um, restrictions. But they, for example, in the food in the food sector, they have put in licenses and permits for people to be able to continue to import whoever, especially in the food in food and health medical, to import whatever resources they need or raw materials they need so that they are able to produce. So already the associations have advocated and the way they've done this is to sit into what we are calling the emergency response 
committees that are either at the national level and at the county level so that they are able to get these permits for these specific industries so that businesses do, do not stop, first of all, but also because these are essential services, then the citizens do not suffer. So it's all about sitting at, at government committees and negotiating from that level. That's how they've been able to sort out the issue of um, value chains, especially the ones that are from on essential services, food, health, um, mostly just those two, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so given the time frame, um, we have two questions. I'm going to go, uh, Babatola, I see you don't have audio. So if you can put your question in the chat, we'll try to get that. I will go to uh, Suni uh, now. Suni. Okay. Thank you, Lars. Um, this is um, Sony Omezamaike from uh, Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Um, I wanted to make a point that uh, just at our um, last um, quarterly press conference yesterday, we advocated for um, VAT suspension. We advocated for um, tax rebate for companies. But again, um, government is left to decide. But our point is that, look, count your losses now. Let these companies stay, sustain their businesses. And tomorrow, we are sure of um, collecting company tax taxes from them. But again, like I said, government is now left for government to think. Should we take to this advice? But as at yesterday's um, our press conference yesterday, we made that point to government to look out for different ways to ease things for um, SMEs and companies generally. I just wanted to make that point um, when Mike um, Aladi talks about, talked about uh, if it's possible to ask government about it. Of course, we have done it to ask um, government to do all of this, but like I said, government is left to take a decision. Thank you. Thank you, Suni. Um, now I would like us to, um, so the time, <clears throat> go back to our panelists and ask them for sort of uh, their final thoughts and, and potentially one recommendation for associations or chambers. Uh, let's uh, start with Grace. Okay, so my, thank you, Lars. My, my first, of course, observation and, and what I would really urge all associations to do at this moment, especially the chambers of commerce and the other big associations that represent businesses, is to find evidence. One of the things that I have seen working very well in Kenya is um, KEPSA, which is the Kenya Private Sector Alliance. They quickly came up with a status report of what happened to businesses immediately the lockdown of COVID-19 happened. It's that report that has informed a lot of the negotiations that businesses are able to get, um, uh, you know, benefits from government. They're able to negotiate because there's evidence out of it. Out of that now, there are many uh, evidence or surveys that are going through with different associations, different organizations, and government is able to rely on that and quickly get convinced. So if you don't have something that you can prove to showcase your, your issue, then you are just saying it's, it's hearsay and government may not quite work with you very easily with that. So evidence-based advocacy is what will work at this moment. While you're at it, make sure that you say it and say it loudly so that you are never forgotten by your members because you need them to remember you now and always. Thank you very much, Lance. Thank you, Grace. Uh, uh, let's turn to Bob. Um, thank you, Lars. Grace, I think that I would hire you. I love your communication and your insights to, to, to effective advocacy. Good work. Um, you know, I've written about eight points out of this session. I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll write them down and send them to Lars um, about the flexibility and, and repurposing. And, but I, I, what I'm reminded as we go through this pandemic is of Apollo 13, which launched 50 years ago in April. 
And the, the statement that came out of that launch was failure is not an option. Failure is not an option. And everything we're talking about, whether we meet Grace and you're sharing the information, Mike's passion, SUNY's platform, um, you are doing a really good job. I have great respect for all of your organizations, your, your leadership and your boards of directors. Um, and I would take the same message as Apollo 13, the, the launch to the moon with three men from Florida, my state, um, but it never made it to the moon. So failure is not an option. There's going to be a lot of, lot of, lot of uh, urgencies, but I know all of you will be successful. So thank you for the opportunity. I always learn from you too. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And thanks everyone for participating. Uh, we have a couple of webinars we will be hosting at the same time on Wednesday. Uh, the next one will actually be Grace uh, talking a little bit more about patients. Okay. And then we will invite Bob back uh, to talk to us about how associations can actually raise revenues and uh, in terms of, of their sustainability um, in order to survive. And so uh, in the next two weeks, we will, next week we'll be having Grace on strategic communications for chambers and associations. And then we will invite uh, Bob back again to host, uh, host this. I want to thank everyone for participating. I know some of you have experienced uh, communication challenges trying to join our webinar. We're sorting through them, and hopefully by next week, we will have an easier system for all of you to actually log in and be able to participate. Again, I want to thank everyone. And with that, uh, I will end the meeting. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you, Grace. And thank you, Wumi. And, uh, and definitely thank, uh, thank you, Michael, for uh, doing such a good job trying to make this work. So again. Everyone have a good afternoon and be safe. Thank you.